see, almost there, not quite. 2017, just last year, was the year that Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies really hit the public consciousness for the first time. You can see it if you look at this graph. Google searches for the past five years for the word Bitcoin. 2017, really clearly obvious on that graph. You don't have to look very hard to find the reason why. This is the same five years of the price of a Bitcoin. 2017, pretty obvious on this graph too. At the start of 2017, a Bitcoin cost 1,000 US dollars, roughly. At its high point in December 2017, that was 20,000 US dollars for a single Bitcoin. That price is now down 70% on that high at around about 6,500 US dollars today. That volatility, that rapid change in price, is what's driving the interest in Bitcoin. And it also drives this crazy hype and headlines around Bitcoin. Let's look at a couple. Do we stay in Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies for the long haul? This is the Financial Times opinion section. Or, I told you investing in Bitcoin was a bad idea. The Financial Times opinion section. Just two weeks later. Which is it? What do we do? What I really want to do is, is look at the idea that there might be another way of thinking about this. That actually, the value of these cryptocurrencies, the investment, is less interesting and less disruptive than the technology that sits underneath them, the blockchain technology that sits beneath those cryptocurrencies. And so we'll look, we're going to take a quick look at cryptocurrencies because that's where the story of blockchain started. We'll take a quick look, but really I want to focus today on the use of blockchain technology, the other use cases that are starting to emerge. But let's start by talking about email. 20, 30 years ago, email entirely changed the way that we communicate with each other. Because now, you can send an email, send a document perhaps, uh, anywhere in the world. And we do, we send 12 million emails every second worldwide. The interesting thing about that document is that you are sending a copy. Now, if I send you an email, I keep the original of the document, you get a copy of it. And that's fine for documents. It might be fine for photos, it's fine for... PowerPoint presentations, but it is not fine when we talk about money. Because if I were to send you some money in an email, and I keep the original and you get a copy of that, I don't think you're going to be very happy. And global finance is certainly not going to be very happy. So this is called the double spending problem, and it's one of the key problems in, uh, in all of our online payments. And this is why, when you go online to make a payment, whether you are doing it in a, a wallet, a digital wallet, if you're doing it um, through your online banking system, using your credit card, however you do that, there is a large central institution, a bank or a government agency, or these days perhaps Apple or PayPal or Google, stood in the way of that transaction, making sure that it happens. And all that's really happening there is your bank account's going down, somebody else's bank account is going up, and somebody else is securing that for you. It's like the internet moved on into the 21st century, but somehow digital payments got left behind. We didn't keep up with how digital payments could work online. And that was something that Milton Friedman talked about way back in 1999. He said, one thing that's missing but will soon be developed is a reliable e-cash. He went on to talk about what he meant about that. He said, somewhat thing that on the internet, person A can deliver a payment to person B without them having to know who each other are. He's talking about the digital equivalent of me handing over a physical note. If I go into a shop and I hand over a physical note, I don't need to know anything about the person on the other side of that transaction. And that is what he was looking at for our digital payments. Friedman died uh, in 2006, so he wasn't around to see this happened in 2008, the white paper from Satoshi Nakamoto that started the Bitcoin revolution. The first line of this white paper describes exactly what Friedman was predicting. A purely peer-to-peer -peer version of electronic cash would allow online payments to be sent directly from one party to another without going through a financial institution. That is it. And in 2009, the next year, 
Bitcoin was born. So how does it work? How does Bitcoin work? Basically, the difference between that and how we do online payments otherwise is that anybody can go online, they can create a payment uh, on the Bitcoin network. It's secured using public-private key cryptography and it's sent out to this vast network of nodes around the world, each one of them maintaining a copy of this entire digital ledger. Each one uh, verifies that the transaction is correct and every 10 minutes or so, all of the outstanding payments get, uh, transactions get gathered up and put into a chain of blocks by somebody called a Bitcoin miner. And those organizations are competing with each other to create the next block to ensure that each of those transactions is valid. By the way, we're not at block 60 anymore. It's more like 600,000 now. Of course, one of the interesting things about this is this concept of a chain of blocks. This is one of the most important things. Every block contains a fingerprint from the block before it. And that means that's really important because it means you cannot go back and change history. This is one of the most important pieces about how blockchain creates trust. You cannot go back and change one of these blocks without changing every block after it. This, you'll recognize one of these exponential graphs. This is the graph of the amount of computing power being used to secure the Bitcoin network right now. This is actually about a month out of date now. Uh, 35 or so exahash. Um, so this is a measure of computing power. And to give you some context, if I were to take the world's largest supercomputer and add it to this network, it would make basically no difference whatsoever. I could take 20 million versions of that world's largest supercomputer, I can add it to this network, and I might get to 1%. There is an unthinkably large amount of computing power being used right now to secure the Bitcoin network. And that comes with its own problems. It comes in particular with a problem of electricity or energy usage. The estimates are that the Bitcoin network right now uses the same amount of electricity as a small country. And that, for a world facing climate change issues, is a significant problem. However, bearing that in mind, right now, with this network, we have a way that anybody can create a secure transaction in a way that is completely tamper-proof, open to anybody in the world, and does not require a central institution to create it. And Bitcoin is not the only one. There are, of course, hundreds of thousands now of digital assets, of cryptocurrencies. This is uh, the top 10 by market capitalization from about a week ago. There are today 30 cryptocurrencies with a market capitalization of more than a billion US dollars. This is a hugely growing market. What about then the underlying technology? What about blockchain? So, Cryptocurrencies is probably the largest use case right now for blockchain. But at its heart, blockchain technology is all about creating trust, it's about creating trust between people and organizations. And as we live more and more of our digital lives online, our own digital lives, of our company's digital lives online, we need to create that trust in lots of ways. We need to think about trust in ownership, trust in process, trust in quality, trust even in ethics and values. And up until today, we have needed to rely on large central institutions to create that trust for us. But now we have a whole different way of doing that. Before we talk about some of those use cases, just want to be clear on one thing. We're not talking about a blockchain here. We're talking about large numbers of blockchains hundreds of them, perhaps thousands of them. And the way that you design a blockchain is really important. There are lots of different things to think about. I just want to talk about two before we talk about the use cases. The first is who can use your blockchain. The ones that we've talked about, Bitcoin and the other cryptocurrencies, are what you call permissionless blockchains. They are public, they're open. Anybody in the world can go on and use them. But there is an alternative. You can have a permissioned or closed blockchain, something where uh, you choose the organizations or the individuals that are allowed to be part of your blockchain. And that has an impact on this second question. And this is who creates the next block? 
How do we determine what goes onto our blockchain? The Bitcoin blockchain, this highly energy inefficient process that we use right now for creating cryptocurrencies, is called proof of work, where you compete using computing power. Proof of stake is another way of doing this in a permissionless environment, where instead of competing with computing power, you put up a stake in the currency that you're talking about. But when you get out of a, permission, a permissionless environment and into one where you know all of the participants in your network, you have lots of different ways that you can create the next block. And it may well be that you just say, it's just going to go round each participant in turn. And if for some reason they're not able to create the next block, if their system is down at the time, it just moves on to the next person. So there are options around here. Bear that in mind as we go through these use cases. As you heard from Jeff, my background is in financial services, and this is where I started thinking about blockchain technology. And this is where I expected the first big gains would be made. Uh, and there are some gains that have been made, uh, in, particularly in stock markets around the world. But bear in mind, this is a heavily regulated industry. And so these gains come relatively slowly. But we're seeing them in Thailand, very definitely. Uh, the Stock Exchange of Thailand, who clearly represented here, launched a blockchain-powered uh, area for startups to do crowdfunding, uh, SET Live. Other areas around the world actually using blockchain technology to replace components of their main systems now. ASX moving to a settlement system that is blockchain-based. They have said by the end of 2020, now I've worked in lots of IT projects uh, in large institutions, I'm going to put that in 2021. That's where they're up to. This announced just, uh, just over a week ago. A trial for a digital currency for interbank settlement happening here in Thailand. And again, this is something that we're starting to see. This is um, the use of blockchain technology for, for settlement between banks is something that's happening a great deal across the world. For international payments in particular, we've seen that here in Thailand for over a year now. Uh, with SCB and Ripple. Just a couple of weeks ago, however, we saw Banco Santander announce that they will be using this Santander OnePay FX for its customers directly. So this is the first time that we've really seen blockchain being marketed to the public by the banks. And that's a really interesting move, I think, because up until now, it's been all about the back-end systems. And now we're starting to see it as something that customers really want and are actually starting to value. And that goes back to this idea that the public is starting to really grasp this concept of crypto assets. And this is the last one I wanted to talk about in financial services. Uh, Thai banks backing a blockchain platform to digitize contracts. So this is letters of guarantee. And now we're starting to see huge efficiencies appearing in our financial services uh, as a direct result of this. You will, I'm certain, have heard of one of the other things really impacting the way that financial services works, particularly for startups. And that's this uh, an idea of initial coin offering. This is a way that blockchain-based companies raise money. They offer a coin, a digital asset to the public, and they raise money normally in another cryptocurrency, blockchain or Ether. One of the interesting things about this area is that it has had a huge amount, again, of hype and headlines. And that can, shall we say, tend to attract the wrong type of entrepreneur at times. And so we've seen headlines like this. Cryptocurrency startup Confido that, by the way, means I trust in Italian, which is hugely ironic, uh, disappears with $375,000 uh, from their ICO. They raised their money and just ran. And this is one of the problems, of course, with cryptocurrencies. Another exponential curve we might prefer not to see, the next one we saw, $2.7 million from Benefit. The next one we saw $660 million as Pincoin did exactly the same. This is an area that cannot stay unregulated. We need to be starting to think about how do ICOs work. And the great thing is that Thailand is actually a world leader in this space. There are other countries starting to produce ICO regulation, but most of them are just going with the it's not allowed here version of that. 
in May 2018, just a month ago, we saw the in It's Not Allowed Here version of that in Thailand. But just a few weeks later, your ICO regulations announced and them coming into effect in just a few weeks' time. Requiring companies to do a, a, a large number of things, but those three are the key. What type of token is it that you are issuing? What is this coin? We'll talk about that in a second. A cap on the amount that can be raised from uh, the retail public, with a larger amount being allowed from wholesale, and screened by the SEC locally for scams. Good luck with that. <laughs> All I'm going to say is these are sometimes, sometimes very easy to spot, by the way. One of those uh, that I talked about earlier, literally the people involved had put up photos from a yearbook and stolen a white paper from another uh, website. Some of these are relatively easy to spot. But some of them are quite hard. And we're expecting five ICOs here uh, in just a few weeks' time as, a as these regulations come into effect. So the world moving on very quickly in Thailand in this space. This type of coin question is a very interesting one. Uh, Thailand has defined its types of coins specifically, but these are the five types that we tend to think about broadly. Cryptocurrencies we've already talked about. Utility tokens, a coin that you can basically use to purchase a service is the way to think about that. Asset-backed tokens, this idea that you might tokenize a larger asset. You might have a house that you turn into thousands of tokens. You might have a mine. You might even tokenize fiat currency. And we're starting to see this happen so that a US dollar now has a coin, a USDC, uh, that's the equivalent of it. And these last two, enterprise tokens and equity tokens, much more like securities, where you might get a share in the profits of the company. Enterprise tokens tend to be, you might get a share of the profits for a year, or you might get a share of the profits from a specific project. Equity tokens, literally replacements for the equities that we've already seen. And now we are starting to see the exchanges going, ah, oh, OK. This is where we need to be moving. How do we allow trading in those types of assets? Overstock.com have been involved in this from the start with their uh, subsidiary T0, and they are now launching a security token exchange, a regulated exchange in the US. And this one, very interesting. Coinbase, one of the most well-known organizations in the crypto space, have just said that they now have, a, 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 they are now regulated in the US to offer blockchain-based securities. Now, this was their announcement of this. And buried in there was this statement. We can envisage a world where we may even work with regulators to tokenize existing types of securities, bringing to this space the benefits of cryptocurrency-based markets. If I was still working in a stock exchange, that would concern me a great deal, because the crypto world is coming after uh, what we think of as regular securities. Uh, right now. Tightly wrapped up in financial services use is this idea of a digital identity. It's very hard for us to continue to work in this space if we don't know who it is that we're working with. It's particularly hard to regulate this space if we don't know who we're working with. And unfortunately, this has been done in a very paper-based way for a long time. This is how we do digital identity online. We ask people for their passports. We ask them to take photos of their driving licenses. Increasingly, we might be starting to see fingerprints or retina scans or DNA. I'm not sure that I really want to be sharing that information with everybody on the internet, though. And sometimes we see this type of way of identifying ourselves. Do we authorize ourselves through Facebook or Twitter or Google? Again, I'm not sure that this is how we want to be doing this in the long term. Blockchain gives us a whole new way of thinking about digital identity. Uh, the idea of so self-sovereign ID, where you hold your own information. You only allow people who need it to be able to see the information that you hold. Uh, this, the fact that the blockchain or a blockchain can be tamper-proof uh, allows perhaps a bank to verify that information, and then you to be able to pass that on and show that it has been verified and not have to keep doing the same verification over and over again. The prize in this space is enormous. Uh, 
Bloomberg Intelligence talked about so blockchain is coming everywhere, ready or not. I love the headline. They were talking about the prize for anti-money laundering, uh, the anti-money laundering space for banks. Millions, hundreds of millions of dollars of fines now being levied every year in the U.S. And in the U.K., the Royal Bank of Scotland employs 2,000 people, and their only job is to look after KYC and anti-money laundering regulations for the bank. RBS have just said that they intend to move to a blockchain-based system, and they believe that will save them 95% of those people. So there's a there's a large prize to be had here, and we're seeing this happen in Thailand also. So moving uh, that moving on digital identity project with Omis, which is a um, a very well-known cryptocurrency uh, company. Other areas, though. Have started to see movement happen in some ways much quicker than financial services. Areas that are less well regulated, uh, or less requiring of regulation. So we're seeing in the supply chain area, Maersk, the shipping company, creating a blockchain with IBM for a wide range of participants in the shipping space to get involved. One of the interesting things about blockchain technology is you cannot do it by yourself. If you are Maersk and you go, okay, I'm creating a blockchain and it's just mine, then it's not a blockchain; it's just a database. And so you need to think about who are your participants, even if it is a closed system. Who are your participants? And Maersk have a wide range of them. They have Holt Port, Houston, and Port of Rot Rotterdam, the ports. They have the customs authorities, U.S. Uh, customs authorities. They have logistics companies. They have suppliers. They have around about 50 organisations already on this blockchain, and more waiting to be added. So the interesting thing about this is a wide range of organisations participating. Walmart and IBM also doing the same. Walmart saying to their suppliers, "What do we have? You know, we have a lot to gain by being able to trace all of our products through a blockchain that that is tamper-proof." The thing that Walmart were really interested in is how can they react if they have a food contamination scare. And before their blockchain system, they they anticipated that it could take up to three days to locate where all of the food that that is contaminated is. And after this, that is now measured in seconds. Yes, it still takes time to get it off the shelves, but now we're talking about seconds to know. Where all of that is, rather than days, a huge difference. Again, Walmart working with their suppliers, though it's not a Walmart blockchain. It is them and their suppliers working together. Some very large names in there: Nestle, Unilever, and others. And that brings us on to this idea of well, where do our goods come from? And this one's been an area that's been very well explored by a number of companies. First, I want to talk about is Everledger. They wanted they started by working with diamonds. Uh, and they went on to look at a number of other high-value assets, and they were exploring this idea of how can we, as a retail customer, when I walk into the store, how do I know that my diamond is not a blood diamond, is not a conflict diamond? How do I know that it's not stolen? And so they have now got millions of diamonds on their blockchain that the retailers, etc., can can follow the entire path from mine. All the way to it landing in the retail store, and show the customers that path. And the interesting thing is, they found out the customers are really interested in that. They really care about not just is it a conflict diamond, but where has it been? Who are the people who um, have been involved with this diamond all the way along its along its path? We're also seeing other organisations. This is provenance in the UK starting to move that out into things like food and clothes and other assets. And block verify, looking at uh, the how does that work for pharmaceuticals? Now, the, this really important idea that the pharmaceuticals are actually what we think they are. How do we know that they are exactly what they say? Lastly, I just want to talk about this idea of smart contracts. And if you've been following the press, you will certainly have heard of these. And we'll just look at a couple of ways in which these might work. The main area in which, or the main、uh, blockchain on which smart contracts have been created to date, is Ethereum. And this allows, instead of just putting data onto your blockchain,、uh, you can put instead a small, a tiny computer program 
onto the blockchain. And instead of that data just being spread out around this set of nodes, the computer program gets set out, and it gets executed across all of those set of nodes. And so you get the same answer from everybody. And that allows for lots of different things to be done. This experiment, now a couple of years ago, uh, allowed a cotton, a, it was a, a, a transfer of cotton from the US to China. And the participants agreed that when the GPS positioning showed that that had arrived in China, automatically that contract would execute. And the cotton changed hands and the, the money changed hands. And so the, the possibilities there for, um, for changing the way that trade is done in the supply chain is very interesting. But it also allows for entirely new areas where we haven't seen uh, automation previously. Power Ledger is an Australian company also operating in New Zealand, where I'm from, and they are allowing peer-to-peer -peer trading of energy that comes from solar power on people's roofs directly to the community around them without any intervention of a third party in the middle. This would have been impossible without smart contracts previously. And Golem, the worldwide supercomputer. This allows the peer-to-peer -peer trading, again, of your spare computing capacity to people who need it. Now, obviously, we've seen this done before. We've seen it. You can go and buy computing capacity when you need it, but you buy it from a third party. This is directly peer-to-peer -peer trading so that somebody who needs computing capacity can buy it from you, and you can be paid for your spare computing capacity. So that's some of the ways in which we're starting to see use cases for blockchain technology emerge. I genuinely believe that blockchain is one of the most disruptive technologies of our time. Yes, it has a number of issues around it. We are starting to see problems with scaling. Obviously, we're seeing problems with energy usage. We're even seeing problems with criminal behavior. But we're talking about a technology that is very early stages. This is blockchain version 1.0. And so there are solutions to those problems. We are seeing technological solutions. There'll be governance solutions. There are regulatory solutions appearing. It's a bit like the internet in the early 90s. It's this like, huge opportunity in front of us. It's just that the way through it is not always that clear. But I believe that if we can get through that, the prize is enormous. Because the prize that we're talking about is an entirely new way of creating trust that's built specifically for the online age. And that will touch everything and every industry. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Mandy. Are you ready for some questions? Yes. You have questions. Do you have answers? <laughs> I will try answers, yeah. Uh, all right. Okay. Let's see what we can do. So sure. yeah, you have quite a few questions, as often is the case when we have a blockchain session. There's a lot of curiosity out there. So one of the ones I'd like to queue up first, this morning both Ramez and Peter emphasized the importance of experimentation yeah. and having a bias for action. And for folks and organizations out there that would like to start getting hands-on experience with blockchain technology or development, what do you recommend? What are the places to start? So, well, there's a number of things here. I, I emphasized when I was talking that blockchain is not something you do by yourself. So really, it's about finding people to collaborate with when you're thinking about blockchain technology. So working with your suppliers or your customers, uh, working with other people in your industry, there are a large number of areas where people can collaborate already. Uh, in the banking world, that's often organizations like R3 or Hyperledger. Uh, but yeah, finding people who are already working this space. The other thing I would say, though, is it's quite easy now to access blockchain as a service. Uh, so you're seeing you know, Microsoft and Amazon and others providing blockchain as a service. And obviously, I mentioned IBM a number of times. They uh, are heavily involved in space. So finding people to work with is the right way to go about that. Another question when we're considering the, the future of this technology, which, as you said, is very much in its infancy, yeah. right? We talk about all these other exponential technologies, many of which we've, we've been developing for decades yeah. in some cases, and this is one that is truly early days. Yeah, very new. And I, I'm curious, how do you foresee the regulatory 
environment developing and what are the implications of the possibilities there that we should be aware yeah. of? One of the things that I think is going to be really important for blockchain technology is how the regulatory environment develops globally. This is not something that can be regulated country by country. So we're making a great start by looking at you know, how might we do it in Thailand? How might we do that in the US? How might we do it in New Zealand? But eventually, we're going to have to think about a single way of doing this globally. And that collaboration amongst regulators is going to be really important. But the ability for the regulators to take risks and for the regulators to experiment is actually also really important. That's actually even harder, I think, sometimes than it is for the companies. Because companies can take a risk and make a mistake but a regulator makes a mistake, and that is headline news and a serious problem. So part of it will be that experimentation for them, too. And something that came up during your session that participants have asked, and I, I wonder about this periodically as well, given the, the origins of blockchain technology and, and coming out of the white paper and Bitcoin and whatnot, is the idea of a private blockchain somehow <laughs> not inimical and diametrically <laughs> opposed to the, the spirit that the technology was originally developed in? I think that's probably right. I think it is actually, uh, if you were to look at the, philo uh, the philosophy behind why Bitcoin was created, like almost directly as a result of some of the uh, behavior of the banks at the time, uh, you pr would probably find that the founders, if we knew who they were, would be horrified. Uh, but the fact is that this is a technology that will be used in lots of different ways. And I suspect that in the long term, we will see many of these private blockchains becoming more and more public. And that uh, it'll be a bit, again, like the internet of the 90s. I remember I worked at an organization in the 90s and they were like, no, no, we're only having an intranet. There'll be no internet for us, no public facing piece of this. And of course, that has moved on enormously. And there are different uses uh, and organizations have different uses for private and public blockchains as well, I think. And so in a way, we might see with the democratization of the technology in aggregate, actually gradual democratization of some of the specific instances as think, those, yes? Yeah, I think that's right. And I think if you look at that in financial services in particular, some of the areas that we see with um, you know, huge walls around them, like stock exchanges, uh, will in fact become more democratized as this technology takes over. All right, one more while we oh, have you. Yeah. Uh, because I imagine a lot of folks in the audience are very interested in this topic and are going to want to learn more. Where do you recommend we can go beyond? Uh, this was a fantastic short session, but I feel like we just dipped a toe <laughs> in, in the deep pool of blockchain impact. Uh, what would you recommend for folks who want to extend that learning? It depends on where you're starting from. Uh, if you're starting from, a, you know, a, a interest but without a huge technological base. Uh, I have a website that I recommend to everybody called bitsonblocks.net, uh, which has a gentle, they call this this gentle introduction series, and it's everything from blockchain through digital assets through ICOs uh, in a really readable fashion. Then there are, once you get beyond that, there are so many books out there, um, so many different places to learn, so many videos online. Yeah. All right. Great. Well, Mandy, thank you so much. Thank you.